this is the last talk of uh, today. Uh, Chris um, has been carrying a massive analysis of uh, entropy in, in text with, uh, with some, I would say, discoveries that uh, he and I would like, would like to, to think about them and see whether they are triggered or not. Uh, um, also, if you have some, uh, some ideas for improving, uh, that would be great. So, yes. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so, I guess the good news is that there isn't that much math in here as compared to the last talk. <laughs> oh, the good. But maybe it's not a good thing, I don't know. <clears throat> but yeah, as Ramon said, it's about an analysis we did with more than a thousand languages, texts of more than a thousand languages, and Ramon actually told me that one of the findings, namely that there is a linear relationship between unigram entropies and entropy rates of words, um, is really interesting. By now, and I should talk about it here more specifically because we had other findings that I thought were also interesting, but this is maybe particularly interesting. By now, actually, I think that there must be some, well, trivial mathematical connection between the two. Um, I'm, I'm convinced about that just by looking at the data, but I, I don't have the mathematical skills to show it, but I'm sure that there is. Uh, I still think it's interesting as it applies to natural languages and why it applies to natural languages. I, I will try to give kind of a and more intuitive linguistic explanation of why you find this in the end. Okay, this is the outline, uh, basic outline actually. Most of the time I will spend on the theory and methods, also some time on the data, because I think it's amazing what the people who have collected the data did. and. Uh, then some of the results and a little bit of the discussion. As I said, some of the discussion of why, linguistically speaking, we find this kind of pattern. So this is the paper that was just published, which uh, this talk is based on, together with a friend of mine from originally from where I did my PhD in the UK, uh, Dimitrios Alicaniotis, and then Michael Sizzo. He created the parallel Bible corpus, so the massively parallel corpus that we use here for more than a thousand languages and I think the work he and his collaborator Thomas Meyer did is really amazing. That's why I also asked him to be part of the project and he is the one who knows the corpus best so you could also give me feedback on what on whether what we are doing makes sense. And then of course Ramon um, uh, gave me a lot of feedback on the mass and we discussed a lot of very fundamental issues of information theory and here we actually hope to get even more input from the experts. So, very intuitive terminology. Actually, this introduction is very similar to what Alvaro said, but much less mathematical. Um, but there are similar concepts. So actually, when, when you talk about entropy, people often talk about order, disorder, regularity, irregularity, predictability, unpredictability, certainty, uncertainty. Actually, when I think about language, what I would like better is to think of it as the number of possibilities, and this is what Lemon suggested in his Student's Guide to Entropy, to not talk about uncertainty, because actually when we communicate, we try to create more certainty about the world that we live in, and we try to communicate something. So actually, the number of possibilities is maybe a better kind of intuitive term. So entropy as choice. Here I created, actually I was the Jim at the typewriter here, I just, there is no model underlying this, I just did this myself. Um, <laughs> so I just pushed A, and of course there is not a lot of choice if you just have one letter in your alphabet, or one word in our case. Um, and here I created a random string with white spaces in between, and there, in a sense, the choice is maximal, because each letter has the same probability, and the white spaces have the same probability. And what you find in actual language, so this is the UDHR that also uh, Isabella used. Uh, all human beings are born free and equal. Actually, in, I think in the future I will use this as examples because I like it better than the Bible. <laughs> but uh, the Bible is more, it's translated into more languages so far. And so if you look at natural language, then it's somewhere in between these two. And we want to try to pin down more precisely where it is and, and what the distribution across different languages is and why it, it is like that. Now, actually before I come to the, to the core part of the analysis, I want to 
talk about a misconception about information theory and natural language. And we all, I think all here agree that we don't share this misconception, but from the linguistics point of view, the reason why people don't come to these kind of workshops on the statistics of language is one of these misconceptions, which is here actually pronounced very clearly by Tecumseh Fitch, who is a very famous biologist also working on language, and actually this book, The Evolution of Language, is a great book. And he doesn't really, he, traditionally he is more on the Chomskyan side of things, but he actually discusses many different theories of language evolution and he gives them you know, equal weight and it's a great book, right? But when he talks about information theory, what he says is that Shannon's theory of information, Shannon's technical sense, uh, Shannon's technical definition of information is actually not relevant to language because it's not equivalent to meaning in any sense. That's actually true at the face of it. However, if we actually look into Shannon and Weaver in 1949, and this is what Weaver wrote, so it's not Shannon, but I assume that Shannon read it and, and said that's, that's fine. So it's in the introduction of Weaver on the, on the, the mathematical theory of communication. What he says is, yeah, there are three different levels, at least, where we can look at language. At level A, we look at the technical problem. How can you transmit information? And then you have level B, which he calls the semantic problem. How can you use these symbol systems to convey meaning? And then even at level C, actually, this is 49, this is 20 years, roughly 20 years before uh, Austin and Searle, pragmatics and how to do things with words. And he already said here in the effectus, effectiveness problem, that's what we would call pragmatics nowadays. How can you do something? Or how can you actually make somebody do something with these, um, with the words? And what he actually says is that, admittedly, the, the mathematical theory applies in the first instant only to problem A. However, uh, the levels B and C can only make use of those signals which adhere to the properties that we find at level A. And what he concludes here is that the theory of level A of the technical problem is at least in a sig significant degree also theory of levels B and C, so of meaning and pragmatics. And actually, so this is actually, I start to realize that, that this is a really important result here by, uh, by Ramon and one of his collaborators. Namely, uh, almost or more than yeah, uh, sixty, more than sixty years later, they actually showed that the mutual information between word forms and meanings uh, in an information theoretic model is actually uh, a, a, an upper. The entropy is actually an upper bound on that, right? So, the lower the entropy of this communicate of the symbol system, the lower the the potential for encoding mutual information between symbols and meanings, whatever, you know, is out there in the world, and objects that you denote. And this is really important. Now, actually, if you think about it, I wouldn't say this as a linguistics conference, but it's, it's really absurd if you think about 20th century linguistics, because Noam Chomsky has become the most famous linguist of all times, and in his original theory of language, he explicitly said, I'm not, I don't care about meaning. He had this example, call us green ideas sleep furiously, and he said, that's a perfectly grammatical sentence, and it doesn't mean anything. So he clearly dissociated his theory of language from meaning, and he became the most famous linguist, and Shannon, or actually Weaver said, we care about, or this can be applied to meaning, and they became disregarded by linguists for saying that meaning is not relevant. So that's complete, it's completely the opposite. And I think that, it, it should be spelled out more precisely of why what, what we are doing here is actually very relevant to, to, to natural language. All right, so here you have the original formulation. We also saw this in uh, Alvaro's talk uh, of the earlier publication, which then became the mathematical theory of communication. So for, uh, for what we want to do, we want to use a vocabulary of words, so real words, not, you know, Sometimes words are called, you know, when letters are called words or whatever. Uh, but in this case, we really want to have word types. Um, so we have a set of word types, which is actually potentially infinite. We got into all kinds of discussions about this. But um, we just assume that it's, it's actually finite for a specific kind of text, but it's potentially infinite in any natural language. 
Um, and so here you have the sum over uh, the probability of the log to the base 2 to the probability of the work. And this minus log to the base 2 of the probability is called the information content. That's also what Alvaro said. And uh, the, the, the intuition here, if you take a very naive view on probability, uh, which you probably shouldn't have, we heard this <laughs> before, but um, if you just look at the frequencies, then for example in the UDHR, human occurs 13 times out of around 2000, and the occurs 121 times, so the information content is lower. That's kind of the basic idea. Now, of course, this is then the, the sum with the probability, so that would be the average information content of word types, which could then run from zero to potentially infinite. It's, interesting. it's an interesting thought to try and understand how the number of words could be infinite, or maybe it's, it's finite. Um, I personally start to become more of an empiricist of saying, you know, take a text, there is a certain number of word types you can define, and then see what the result is. Um, extrapolation is always going to be a difficult issue. So here I created, again, random text by doing chimp at the typewriter. And the point here is that if you have 50 tokens, you will actually, actually the likelihood if you do, if you have a uniform distribution of probabilities over characters and, and white spaces, you will actually get what I got here very often, namely that you just have uh, the same probability or the same frequency for each word, um, and that's actually here the maximum entropy then 5.6. If you look at English with the same number of tokens, you have some repetition, of course, and in and so on are very repetitive. So then that brings the the entropy down. That's just a very basic illustration. But of course, uh, what Shannon already told us in the mathematical theory of communication, and many people after him. It's of course not quite as simple as that, and that's where the real trouble starts. Now, first of all, entropy estimation, as far as we or I know, uh, and we try to read many papers on different entropy estimators, it requires that the, the values of your random variable should be finite, right? So there should be a finite set of word types. Now, as a linguist, and I think actually this is true, this is something that Chomsky said which is actually true, namely there is an infinite productive potential. You can always come up with new words, you can have neologisms, you can come up with derivation, you can come up with compounds, so there is a potentially infinite number of word types in a language. And actually even when you look at massively, at massive corpora like the BNC, the British National Corpus, or now these kind of internet corpora, you will always see that the, the number of types keeps growing, right? And that's, I think, also uh, related to Heap's law, right? That you have this growth curve. Yes. Okay, ask why. Why is that a requirement? Do you know? Uh, it's a well, requirement of the estimation methods that you... But why? Why? Uh, well, uh, it is... Uh, but it's okay if it's not easy. It's not, it's not, <laughs> it's not, so, it's not so easy. <laughs> but, but it appears in, in a few the theorems that, that you that you have to assume that the, that the set of types is finite in order to consistently estimate entropy. I don't think that's necessary. You could have perfectly well a finite entropy based on an infinite number of types as long as the probabilities are not unique. Uh, yes, but uh, uh, but you, uh, but if you but you have to exclude certain patho pathological uh, pathological uh, yes. cases. But still, finiteness in vocabulary is not a requirement. I think you could perfectly have. It. Well, you if, 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 if you impose some other conditions, you can still still estimate entropy. But yeah. let's assume that finiteness is some baseline to estimate entropy. And if distribution there's no uniform distribution, we think you can. Exactly, that's why I say, as long as it's not uniform, you can have, an, you can have an infinite number of types and a finite entropy. Yeah. Yes. Well, uh, I mean, to me, I, you know, I'm really not the person to decide this, but to me, the problem, this is what I tried to formulate also in the writing originally, um, is that if you think about it, if you have a corpus and you calculate the the probability of a word type based on simple frequencies, which you know is apparently not the thing to do, but that's the way I try to think about it. Then you have the probability for each word type. Now you add a new word type, and that 
will automatically change the probabilities of all the other word types, right? So if you do that at infinitum, how are you going to know the probabilities of all the words? Well, that's the good doing theorem. Yeah. Well, you, I think that's, that tries to kind of get around the issue of the long tail, but I mean, to me, I really don't see how you, yeah, I, I cannot think infinity, actually. So I, I don't see how you can get around the issue that you can keep adding stuff and it will change the probabilities of the word types. Okay, think about, for instance, something very simple, a Poisson distribution. Mm -hmm. How many types do you have there? Yeah. It's cool. so what, and it has it's cool. a finite. It has a finite entropy. If you yes. Yes, yes. 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 You, you can have well, yeah, distributions of over, over, over infinitely many times, times, but have finite entropy. It's not. Yeah. So yeah. 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 Uh, which is sitting on infinity many points, but there is a sequence of distributions which behaves like this, runs away from the space. And therefore there is potential that H will increase and down. But what I, what I mean to say is that you have a Poisson distribution, you have discrete types. Yeah. There are infinitely many of them, and there is a finite entropy. No, no, of course. Yeah. So yeah, yeah, you have to explain that to me. Um, yeah, the, yeah. the entropy is actually a direct function of the lambda parameter of the Poisson distribution. Okay. And, and you can yeah. show that mathematically? Yeah. Or it's very yeah. 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 But, but uh, this is something oh, that we, we already yeah. discussed. The, the, pro, the, the point here is that for safety reasons, the, uh, if you look at the papers on uh, entry estimators, this assumption is somewhere, the assumption of finiteness, where it's really something that you strictly need or it's something that, as you said, uh, avoids certain desire uh, situations. Um, it, it's a it's a complex uh, issue. And it, it, we, we have, what we are doing here was just borrowing what others have written when they uh, present the, the estimators. Uh, if, uh, Perhaps you could say you have finite entropy and you don't need to make to make anything stronger than that. Yeah. Uh, yeah, but if they have a, a but infinite support with finite entropy, right? So that's. So I, I, I didn't. I, I might know where this thing comes from. I, are you using any Chao Shen kind of estimator for entropy or something like that? Because some of the estimators of entropy make uh, explicit uh, estimates that depend on the number of unobserved events. Yeah. Obviously, if you have a infinite number of events. Right, which are types in this case, mm -hmm. the estimators. Well, that's how, that's how I understood it. So, but this is the, the thing. It's not like it, this is intrinsic to entropy. It's just intrinsic to the statistical estimator you're using for. No, actually, Chao Shen don't assume finite, finite vocabulary. They even have a, a case with infinite vocabulary. I, I don't know if Chao Shen in particular. What I'm saying is that wh whatever uh, uh, estimates at the same time, the number of unobserved events might break down if you don't have some extra assumptions. So, this is about statistics, mm -hmm. not about it. Yeah, but if, if there is an, an entropy estimator that you know of, which doesn't have this requirement, I'm fine to use it, you know? I mean, in this case, we use what is out there. There is actually a new, so there's also, the one that we actually use, uh, that I'm going to present here is what's called the Nememan Shafi Bialek, yeah. uh, NSB estimator. They use <coughs> mixed uh, Dirichlet prior instead of single Dirichlet priors, you know, the book above my head in terms of, of the mass of it. But they, you know, in terms of convergence properties, they show it's better than the, the naive one, it's better than the Chao Shen, it's better. So, and actually we use all of them and they're all actually highly correlated for our data. So in the end, you know, I didn't even think, okay, I need to find a new one because I could even use the simple maximum likelihood estimator and I'm fine. No, I'm fine. You know, no, if no. you look at the correlations, I'm, I'm going to be fine with my results. But anyways. Go ahead, go ahead. Yes. <laughs> Actually, I didn't even want to talk about this problem. So <laughs> <laughs> the second problem is, <laughs> is, even, is even more problematic, namely that you kind of, you assume, at least as far as I understood, that they are IID, so independent and identically distributed. And then there are shown long-range correlations between words. We have talked about this also with regards to characters, Alvaro. And uh, yeah, here are some examples, kith and kin. If you see kith in English, you know it has to be part of this phrase. 
New York is uh, probably more frequent than just York in itself. So, or, or is going to, this is actually more of an interesting example where you have some paraphrastic construction which reoccurs. So there are short and long range correlations between word types. They're not identically and, and independently distributed. And actually, now I want to talk a little bit more about this uh, issue. We have done some stabilization analyses here as well in the paper, but um, I think this is, this is more interesting in our case. So a related question is that how much does the code text that you have, the preceding code text actually, in a, in a, in a corpus, how much does that reduce the entropy of the word, right? So if you take Unigram entropy, you would assume that this is without code text, or actually you could, you could also ran, randomize word order, um, and then you would get the simple Unigram entropy, and the entropy rate is supposed to be under stationarity, so if you assume that chunks of text have similar properties across the bigger, uh, bigger corpus, um, then uh, the entropy rate is uh, actually the, uh, the entropy of a word conditioned on the code text, or actually conditioned on the, the preceding code text, um, as we construe it. Now, Unigram entropy is defined like this, um, and as I said, we use this estimator of it to overcome this kind of issue that if you have a small corpus, you haven't seen all the types, but they still have a probability. So here you have the gram, uh, this one here means Unigram, so you have the probability of a gram, this is essentially the same formulation that you have seen before, but more generally for grams, uh, this is Unigram, and then you have the vocabulary, the, the set of word types, uh, the set of Unigrams. I'm really sorry, but can you please say what is this G? I don't know. The well, G actually, Unigram, but what is it? actually, I found this in a paper by, I mean, this specific kind of formulation. You mean the mathematical? No, 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 the question is, what is this GI? Oh, the Unigram groups. What does so, unigram. so this would, it would the be... IF a, and Unigram. This is yeah, the IF Unigram. unigram. Yes. So it's the same as... Uh, the frequency of words. It's the same as this WI, as I, but uh, for a gram, more generally speaking. So you could also put in two, then it would be a bigram probability. Right? That, that would be the pair of words. Let's say, W before it was a word. Yes, W yeah, is now, G. It, it, now, it's now, sorry, yeah. It's the same as W. G2 would be two pairs of words, G3 would be three yeah. pairs of words. Yeah. Ah, okay. yeah. 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 I only put it here because one of the ways of how you could implement short and long range correlations is to look at bigrams, trigrams, and grams instead of uh, unigrams or single words. And that's the more general formulation of it. But essentially it's the same as looking at, word, at a word type in this case. Um, well, it's not an estimation because there is no nothing empirical, right? Yeah, it, we will estimate it. Oh. Yeah. Now the entropy rate. This comes from Coburn Thomas. Uh, so the entropy rate here is defined as. Uh, so this is the number of word tokens, and it, as it goes to infinity, uh, the limits of one divided by this uh, the number of, of tokens, and the entropy for a specific gram in our case would be. Um, the uh, the unit this should be small m in both cases. Yeah. Uh, what this? This, this should be small m, uh, uh, lowercase m. Uh, I think if this is if this is the entropy of the of the n gram. Yes. Yeah, yeah but I think I think we use small m because this is this stands for unigram, bigram, trigram. Yes. yes. So you have to divide yeah. it by the length of the gram. Yeah. He's right. By the length of the graph. The ends are the same there. Yeah, yeah all the ends are the same. I thought it's. I, I thought this is the number of, of word tokens as you go through the. No, 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 no. no, no, no. This is this is in the length the of the graph. Okay. Well, it could be there are the two different things. Right? Nobody, the, the, the other doesn't converge. Can the finest he wants. I don't know. I don't know. The entropy yeah. does doesn't converge to the entropy rate, no matter how large your corpus is. If you want convergence as he has there, he needs the ends to be the same. What do you mean? You can take a, a corpus as, as large as you want, and the bigram entropy will be larger than the entropy rate. Sure, it's a lower bound, but um, you can yeah. compute the entropy. Uh, as but otherwise, that, that equation doesn't fall. Yeah, there's a typo here. Uh, it, mm, it should okay. be the. Yeah. 
this. The problem is that you run into data sparsity very quickly. Uh, so Schirman and Grasberger did it for characters instead of words, and they said that beyond five you already need billions of tokens, um, and for words it would be even worse. So that's not really an option. Uh, you can still do it, and I did it at some point and looked at the correlation between unigrams and bigrams and so on, but it, you will definitely run into data sparsity. So what we what I decided to do instead is to use a uh, result by Gao et al. And actually, uh, Yannis Konto Yannis was invited to come here, so I would have really liked to talk to him about this. Um, and what they show is that... Hmm? Unfortunately, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, yeah. Not talk to him. <laughs> so, and what they propose is that you can uh, approximate the entropy rate by this formula, all right? And I've try to wrap my head around what it ex exactly means. Um, so actually this log to the base 2 of i, if you think about it, uh, as, far as, I as far as I understand, it's actually similar to what Alara said about the Boltzmann entropy. Namely, it's the, uh, the maximum possible information content if you think that this i is the running through the text, so that would be the number of tokens that you're looking at. And if you just take the log to the base 2 of i, you get the maximum possible information content in the sense that if each token is different, so you only have different word types, then you have the maximum case where you have the same probability for all of them, namely 1 divided by the overall number of tokens. Um, so this kind of gives you the maximum uh, potential here. And then what you do is you divide it by this length, and this length is defined as the longest contiguous substring starting at this position i, uh, which is also present before, starting at 2. So I will give you an example here. Namely here we have the text that we use in English, the, the beginning of the Genesis Bible. In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was waste and empty. And so at position 2, you haven't seen the before in this, uh, in this instance here, so it's actually 0, then you have to do plus 1, otherwise you would divide by 0. So we have 1. And then as you go through the text, you're just looking back. And here in this case, you have seen the, so you have 1 plus 1. And you go on, and then it starts to be interesting when you actually have some, uh, at this point here, you start looking forward, and you say, and the earth. And you have seen and the earth before, so you have 3 plus 1 is 4. Now if you think about it, uh, this should be done. A bit. So actually what you do here is you're saying the maximum potential, you, you divide the maximum potential here by uh, kind of the redundancy, right? Because if it's very redundant, then this length here will be growing with the number of tokens. And then you get some kind of approximation of uh, how the entropy grows over time as you go through the text. All right. Now, this is actually, this is just the example with the numbers. So the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, and then you see the unigram entropy here in blue, which is somewhat higher as the entropy rate as it's defined by Gaudol. And you can see there is, of course, unigram entropy is always higher, which makes a lot of sense um, because conditioning reduces entropy. So you, you expect that this conditioned entropy is lower. But you can also see that it's always, there is, uh, it actually starts to converge onto a specific kind of value. And this is what we're going to show. Um, but before I get to that, I want to I want to talk a little bit more about the data that we used um, to to estimate this across many different languages. So we have these parallel translations. We focus here on the Bible corpus, and it's out there on the web. 
So you can also use it. Uh, in this case, it's a little bit a smaller corpus of 1,100 texts and 900 languages or so. Uh, but it's actually really amazing work. Because what you get here is you get some information on the corpus. You get verse alignment. So this is book one for verse one and so on. So you get the Genesis in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth here in English. And uh, you also get that for many other languages, different writing systems. So here we have Amharic. You can see that actually, so what you see here is that what they did kind of semi-automatically is to introduce white spaces also between punctuation. Because if you want to get word types, then if there wasn't a white space in between here, if you run a standard kind of tokenization algorithm, it will tell you that it's actually empty and comma, so that would be a word type kind of an issue. And here, for example, you also have uh, in Amharic, in the Gale script, you also have white spaces in between words, and then you have different kinds of punctuation. So it's very helpful to have the white spaces in between. Uh, here you have an example of Mon Khmer, where you don't get any white spaces in between. And actually, they're also in Chinese and in Japanese, you don't have white spaces. Now they're working on it, so they're using uh, algorithms to introduce white spaces. Actually, this is only a very small subset of the of the of the parallel Bible corpus, which doesn't have white spaces in between. It's like less than 1% or so. In most languages, you get some kind of white spaces. Um, uh, or another really tricky issue, which I didn't even realize to start with, but which is tricky, is that in some languages, you also have punctu something that looks like punctuation, which is not. Because this in Quechua here, for example, you have, um, you have, uh, Ejective, so this here, for example, would be pronounced kancha, uh, kanchaika. So instead of kanchaika, kanchaika, you have more of an ejective. And actually, if you again, if you run a tokenization algorithm, it will tell you k is a separate word. Right? That's an issue. Actually, when I talk to people in computer science about this, you know, like right, can I use a good tokenization algorithm across many languages? They will tell you. Yeah, you know, tokenization, that's been solved in the 1990s. Yeah, for English and French, and, you know, <laughs> five languages or so, for 1,500 languages, it's still kind of an issue. And that's why this corpus is really helpful, because they, if you have a white space here and here, you know that this is supposed to be a word type. And this has been done by typologists. Uh, another issue that's really interesting is tone. So here you have uh, Usila Chinantec, Otomanguan language of Mesoamerica. And you can see here there are tone numbers indicating the, the pitch. And so this actually it runs from high is, is a low number. So this would be kind of low tone, higher tone. So something like E la. Um, and if you do, it, so first of all, one issue is, again, tokenization. It will split on these numbers because they're not alphanumeric characters or not recognized as word, as part of words. Um, but if you only use white spaces as they introduce them here, then you're fine. And the second thing, and this is something I would like to work on with one of my students, is you can actually measure how much information is encoded in tone if you remove these tone numbers and then look at the difference in the entropy. And that's actually really cool because then, more generally, with these texts, what you can do is you can remove all kinds of stuff and see how much information is actually encoded in each of the of the different dimensions of linguistic diversity, yeah? Actually, with the Ottomanian languages, you have to be very careful with the tone. Mm -hmm. Because if you are identifying unique word types, the same word type can happen with different tone information, yeah. depending yeah. on the sentential context. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, if the tone is indicated, that's good. Actually, in some cases, it's not indicated, and then you're in a mess, because then you really get lower entro word entropy than you should get if you had the tone, because it's part of part of the word. Um, and this, that's something I try to get an estimate on and I also, I'm also trying to work on. Yeah, so just, just to give you an idea of all kinds of issues that I involve, but also the potential of, of using the corpus. Um, actually, in this, in this study, we also used other corpora to uh, do some of the analyses and then to also compare them and see if the results are robust. So this is the overall sample. And uh, there are roughly 1,900 texts and 1,259 languages. If you take the water log as kind of reference database on how many languages there are, it's around 8,000. So this is 
I think we calculate like 15%, 16%, so you, you know, there's still way to go, but you're getting closer to saying something about languages more, more generally. All right, so here is just a simple plot of the results for uh, Unigram entropy, so this here is the Unigram entropy across languages of the world, so low entropy around seven, and higher entropy around 14. And what's interesting particularly for me is that there are areas in the world, like for example the Andes with many Quechuan languages and others where you have super high word entropy, whereas in other areas like the African savanna you have low entropy and also in Southeast Asia. And I think it, it mostly relates to the morphological complexity of these languages as you increase the number of word types. And we have done some analyses of this. Uh, that's what I'm interested in as a, as a typologist but that's just kind of a side note here. So here is the result for unigram entropies and entropy rates. So here you have the, uh, the entropy, and here you have the density, so this is a density plot. It could also be a histogram with uh, separate uh, columns, but um, the plotting was actually easier with these uh, continuous distributions. So what you see here is that across all these languages, the mean unigram entropy, so this is unigram entropy, is around 9.14 with standard deviation of around 1. And for uh, the uh, entropy rates, it's somewhat lower, as you would expect. I mean, you would generally expect that it's lower at around 6 uh, bits per word. And here we have the difference between the two per language, and that's actually much more narrowly distributed around 3 bits per word. Also, and this is Another result that I'm personally very interested in, the fact that, for example, for Unigram entropy, there is no language below six bits per word, actually. Um, and there was one language, a uh, Zapotecan language, again, of Mesoamerica, with 5.97 in the UDHR. But this, the UDHR in this language only has like 1,000 tokens, so our stabilization analyses clearly showed that this is way too small to really get to a kind of stable value. And also, there might be missing tone marking. So if you had the tone marking, it would be higher. So it seems reasonably fair to assume that really natural languages have a unigram entropy of higher than six bits per word. And then, uh, of course, the question would be, you know, is this the same for other systems that humans produce? Is it the same for animal communication systems? If you can agree on, you know, what corresponds to word in animal communication. But, yeah, I, I think there is something interesting to, to discuss. But what we actually, what I wanted to discuss here more is this linear relationship between the two. So if you think about it, the distributions look reasonably similar, and the difference between them is much more narrowly <coughs> distributed, so what it suggests is that there is a linear relationship between them. And there actually is, right? So here you have the unigram entropy, as estimated by the nememan shafi bielek um, estimator, and here you have the entropy rate. We actually we implemented this ourselves. Um, so you, you have we, we put it online. It's called H rate. It's an R package. But my friend Dimitrius he actually uh, wrote some Python backend to make it faster. You can you can download it and, and have a look at it um, and use it. And yeah, you get this linear relationship across languages of the world, which has a Pearson correlation of 0.95 course highly significant it's a really big sample of languages and it seems to be the very similar across different areas of the world so these are taken from the glottolog uh, and you can see actually I haven't really put numbers to these slopes and intercepts but they look actually very similar that's the next step I need to do and so what we if you fit a linear model to this then what you get is that the entropy rate is actually very nicely linearly related with uh, an intercept and a slope, and the intercept is estimated by maximum likelihood to minus 1.12, and the slope is 0.78, which is significantly different from one. Right? That's something that Ramon said we should uh, evaluate to start with to try and understand better what's going on there. Now, as I said, I. <laughs> Somehow I have the intuition that this result here must directly somehow be derivable from the mass, from the definition of the entropy rate as we, as we said, as we, as we defined or as Gamma all defined it, and the, the unigram entropy. No, it is not. No. 
No, uh, but uh, this, uh, this result probably says something about uh, the about the universality of learning, <coughs> learning in natural language, and probably all because uh, because the unigram entropy mm -hmm. is a kind of uh, is is the entropy without the cotex, yeah, and entropy rate is with cotex. <coughs> so uh, when you when you just see see a single word, you you assign it the entropy h one. Mm -hmm. But when you learn uh, more and more about the context, you you assign this, uh, the second entropy, and uh, this linear relationships is uh, is somehow suggesting that all languages are kind of equally hard to learn, that you can extra that you can reduce all, reduce almost the same amount of information per uh, per the length of the of the of the word. Yeah, I mean the way I try to formulated is that independent of the language, the cotex reduces the entropy of a word by the same amount, which is yes. roughly three bits per word. Yeah. Yes. Although, I mean, there is a distribution still, right? So there are yes, still languages where it's a little bit bigger, yes, but, but it's much more narrowly distributed. Yes. Um, yeah. I think, I mean, on addition to what Lukas just said, I think your original intuition is actually right, in the sense that although there is not a clear reason why the unigram entropy should be a linear approximator of the of the entropy rate? Mm -hmm. We do know that the unigram the, the unigram entropy is indeed an upper bound for the entropy rate. So if you want oh, yes. a very bad estimator for the entropy rate, we know that the unigram entropy <coughs> the bias is an estimator. Now, what you have there is actually not the real entropy rate, but another estimator of the entropy rate, yeah. which is the Gauss estimator. Yeah. Now, what you're finding is that both of these estimators are linearly correlated. But I think it has to do more with the estimators themselves than with the nature of the true entropy rate, which is unfortunately impossible to compute. <laughs> uh -huh. yeah. No, I think that there is also some... Uh, some no, I, some, I agree, some dependence I agree that, on, on that you're point. right, that there might be that on top of that. But his yes. intuition that it's mathematically related to the estimators, I think, is also correct. Can you say yes, something more about the assumptions of the Gauss estimator? Because that's the assumption of the Gauss estimator is that the process is ergodic and stationary, and uh, probably the the estimator it does not uh, does not uh, does not uh, depend on the uh, on the alphabet size. There is no no smoothing in this uh, in this estimator. But the original theorem of Gal and, uh, and Kontoyanis was proved for, for finding the alphabet only. And I'm not sure whether the proof uh, goes for infinite alphabet as well. And I have a question about the estimator as well. Have you plotted how your Gal estimator changes with corpus size? Yeah. That's it for the European Parliament corpus. Oh, so no, this is 100,000. OK, so it would be interesting to see. Is the horizontal axis there logarithmic or natural? No, th this is both natural. So, yeah, so this is the this is the entropy rate, and this is, so is one hundred thousand. I see. All estimators, you need to plot that logarithmically and see that there is no real no real slopes there. Yes, because it looks a bit like logarithmic. Yes, yes. gross. No, so, but what I mean to say is, this is not a problem. It's, it happens with any estimator you have. Mm -hmm. So you've done, I think, a good job in approximating the entropy rate. But entropy rates are famously elusive to approximate with small corpora. Yeah. And I, mean, I normally use the variations of level C, which are very similar in nature to what you're using. And I find it's very difficult to get them to actually stabilize. Yes. Well, yeah, we, we had long discussions about what convergence is and what stabilization is. And I tried to come up with a, a criterion that is sufficient for me personally. And that is to say, if I want to compare, say, what is this over there? So this is Estonian, this is Finnish, so they have high word entropies because they have a lot of morphology, right? So if I want to be able to say Estonian and Finnish have, say, a higher entropy rate than English, you know, how, what, what kind of criterion could I come up with to say this is really sufficient, a sufficient size, corpus size to say that this is different here, right? 
And what I did is I said, okay, let's look at the window of a specific size, of say 10,000 tokens, get um, the, the entropy rate at certain points within these 10,000 tokens, and then get the standard deviation right, of these estimations. And then say, for me, we said, okay, let's have a threshold for a standard deviation where it should drop below a certain value. And that's what we did here, and what we found, actually, I don't have the plots in here, but what you find is that then the standard deviation drops, and it goes below 0.01 at around 50,000 tokens across these languages. So then you know that you're estimating the end. You know, it's still growing. I mean, one of the reviewers actually said, how do you know that this is not some, um, some, uh, some square root function, right? Well, how do you know that? Function it's not a right root function. <laughs> <laughs> it can be a logarithmic function. Yeah, or how do you know that, it's, that it does keep growing? I, I, I'm actually convinced, yeah, that's, I'm, that's I'm convinced that it does keep growing. Yeah, no, everybody It will does. always keep growing. You cannot, you cannot do better than what you've already done. It's, it's very difficult. Well, I, I think that you can do something in the sense that you can try to uh, restrict the, the, the model space to a number of parametric models of things that do have an asymptote and just be by easy in this respect and say, well, given the number of models, I think my goal reasonable will be the asymptotes for all this uh, data I will serve you. That, that's what actually people have done in ecology, right? You, you start to get different species, you, you keep growing, you, you get that actually you don't get to a real asymptote, the, the relative is still one. So you make some assumptions about the smoothness of the function or uh, the correlation between different orders of derivatives, and then you get to an up to a family of, of parametric functions that all could be fit to the data, and then all yield different estimates. And then how do you decide which one to choose? No, this is the thing, you don't decide. You have complete uncertainty over a set of reasonable functions. So, for instance, you won't expect that this is going to jump in this continuous way, right? Well, how do you know, right? You don't know, <laughs> that's the thing. That's well, the thing, you don't know, but right? That's why you go easier. But all these things you can say for the entropy of unigrams of, I mean, there have been people working for that. I mean, I, I think all estimators do have a bias and a variance. What you describe Yeah, I mean, actually, this, these the, are all the, the variance. Sure. You should, uh, if you estimate that your variance and your bias are much smaller than than the, 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 the results you are getting, that's what all you no, are doing. So these are the Unigram and the estimators. The estimators are actually pretty accurate. And you can get them to stabilize for well, uh, the entropy rate. You cannot OK, get but uh, I'm saying what he described is the estimation of, of the fluctuations, the statistical fluctuation. Yeah. I mean, yeah. You have still the systematic fluctuation, the bias. But if you if you are sufficient, I mean, you, we expect this to be reduced with corpus size if you are already sufficiently small compared to your signal. Yeah, that's, well, that's, 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 that's perfectly fine. Well, at least you know that there's going to be a bias in direction that for some of these corpora, you can tell that the, that the, the growth uh, rate it is, is larger than others, right? So what you know is you that... You could set a function to it and, yeah. Well, so it is bias, bias, right? So it's underestimating, so there is a bias, right? So uh, but, but the bias is different across languages. So if, if you assume that all of these growth cures come from a, a, a sufficiently good parametric family, <coughs> then you, you, you might compensate in a direction that goes with intuition, right? Yeah. So that's, that's what I'm saying. saying. What, what, you, what a lot of people have been doing is fit, take down scores and fit an asymptotic curve yeah. and say, okay, well, this, let's assume that this reaches a particular asymptote. Mm. And you know yeah. how many functions you fit that. And based on those data, you say, well, this should converge around here. But I don't think that will change dramatically your results. Yeah, no, it won't. I don't think it will. No. I mean, as I said, so these are the nine estimators in this R package for House and Strimmer for Unigram entropy. And uh, you can tell from this, I mean, some of them... Uh, oh, that's, that, that's yeah. House and Strimmer, not Gao entropy. Th so this is now the unit. so this is, this is Gao, that's yeah. what we implemented, yeah. that's entropy rate. And this is the same for Hauser and Strimmer's package yeah. for Unigram entropy. But the problem, I mean, Hauser and Strimmer is not adequate for this data set. Because it's how the instrument is based on the finite support set that you have already observed. That's you are talking about the shrinkage entropy. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And so I think the Gao one. No, but the so the, the package provides. So there is one of them is shrink. This is shrink, yeah. and the others are other implementations of other entropy estimators, right? Except for NSP, that's implemented in Python, we use that as well. Yeah. But this is this is the entropy package by Hauser and Strimmer, yeah. and then they say, yeah, our shrink. Estimator is actually better than the others. If you know the support. Yeah. Yeah. But it actually, so if you look at this, and I, we also have the correlations between them um, in, in the paper. I mean, 
e even for even for the maximum like even the, the, this naive maximum likelihood estimator gets a, a correlation with all the better ones of 0.99 or something. Yeah. So for me, cool. you know, I'm I'm fine with that. I don't know. I mean, maybe you need to have it more precisely, but for me, this is it was totally fine when I saw it. So. But I mean, at the end, what you're finding is that what we have is a linear correlation between two estimators because the unigram entropy is itself an estimator of the entropy, even if bias and all that you want. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, all right. Let me go to the my the kind of linguistic explanation of what's going on. But why linear? Yeah, well, I'm not sure about linear, but so, so here actually I did this yesterday. So I could I could give you the exact data points, but I don't have the data with me. I should put it online. That's a good reminder, actually. So what you will find is that English text will have uh, a unigram entropy of around 8.5 bits per word, right? I mean, there are like 10 or 20 different English Bible translations, and so they will fall somewhere here. So some so some of these points are going to be English translations. And Italian text, so they have lower unigram entropy and they also have, on average, lower entropy rate, right? And then if you take Italian as another example, it's somewhat higher, so it's somewhere around here. So why is that? Let me just give you a very simple example. Imagine that this is your Italian toy corpus, right? So this is Vado, Vai, Va, Andiamo, Andate. So this is uh, to go in uh, different persons, and also in the in the future tense, Andra is he he would go or she would go, um, uh, she will go. Sorry. Now, if you look at this corpus, due to the fact that the information is stored in the word forms in Italian here in these verb forms, what happens is that you have only, there is not a single verb form which is repeated in this corpus, right? If you assume that actually this here means everything else is equal then all these word forms are different. Hence, you're going to have a high unigram entropy in this corpus, and you're also going to have a high entropy rate because we estimated entropy rate based on repetitions of words, and there are none here, right? And whereas in English, you have I go, you go, you already have the first repetition of go, um, and in this case, in the periphrastic construction, you already have two uh, will go as, as a repetition of what you've seen before. So what is actually, linguistically, I think, the, the result is that what in English, there is a whole phrase which corresponds to what would be a single word in our definition in, in Italian. So in a sense, what's happening here is that all the languages encode very similar information. I mean, that's what we expect because it's a parallel corpus. But they do it differently if we accept this kind of word definition that we take here. I mean, in a polysynthetic language, it would be even, you would have even more words in English that essentially encode the same information. Yes. And how about you divide the, the word-based entropy by the average word length in each of those languages? You I said think it would be very close to a constant. Yes, I, I suppose so. The average word, yeah, okay, so you're normalizing by the fact the, the entropy yeah. per, per letter or morpheme or whatever you want. It's a compressor rate. Yes. I think what you find is that, it, I guess here you already see it a little bit, you see that those Italian words, per words, are actually longer than those English words. Mm -hmm. If you now divide yeah. both of them by their average word length, they're actually going to be balanced out. So what you mean is that per unit of sound... Well, it depends also on the writing system as well. Still, but even, even if you have a, a, a writing system with syllables, Yes. Your average world length is going to be very low. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think you're right. Yeah. yeah, no, I think you're right. Actually, with the different writing systems, um, I, I should do it for Hebrew and also yeah. for Arabic, uh, because there you would expect it. So, so actually, the cool thing is that in some cases, you have the same language, the same text, in two different writing systems, yeah. right? So, for example, Uyghur is both written in Arabic and yeah. in Latin. So you can compare them. And actually, there isn't really a big difference, but I looked it up just before, and that's, I think, because in, in the Arabic script, you also have the vowel indications. So if you didn't have these, then you would probably have lower word entropy. <clears throat> but generally speaking, so you have so, quite many, or some languages, where you have Kyrillic in Latin, and it's literally the same. What also surprised me is that the Hangul script of Korean and the Latin transliteration, they're exactly the same, although actually Hangul also implement, it's, it's kind of a... It's a very phonetic, it's a very phonetic system. Yeah, but it, it kind of 
so it has symbols for uh, also kind of syllables, right? I mean, you you include uh, you include vowels in the symbol of a consonant. But it, it, it even has a phonetic feature, so yeah, it's beautiful. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's it's a designed language, right? But it's it's I mean, the, the entropy the word entropy is exactly the same for both of them. So there, the writing system doesn't seem to make a big difference. So imagine that you just take the Latin cases, the Latin alphabet cases, you divide by the word length, you're very likely to obtain a very much of a constant, in as much as a constant can be seen, because you're never, no matter how good your data is, you're never going to observe a full constant. Yeah. You're always going to get a normal distribution with some variation. Yeah. 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 Well, I can predict that for Polish, it would be it would be lower than for English per letter. Because we have Do you use a lot of digraphs and trigraphs. Yes, because we use a lot of digraphs and uh, trigraphs. Yeah, actually, the the entropy. So we have the entropy. Usually, the, usually the translation of the text in Polish is a bit longer than in English. It would be really cool to just do it with average phonetic lengths, for instance. Oh yes. Ah, oh, here, yeah. It's relatively high. Actually, I did I did a another study on. on Morphological complexity based on corpora, and there Polish was actually lower than I would expect from reading some about the crown because it's just crazy in terms of aspect marking, and yes. uh, you have met, you have six or seven different cases, so you have loads of different word forms. Um, and eight genders. <laughs> yeah. Eight genders? No. Yes, because if you if you if you do a very thorough morphological analysis, the three the three and the European genders uh, can, be decompo can be can be decomposed into subclasses. So there are three masculine genders, uh, three uh, three genders for for for, for plurals, mm -hmm. for plural mm -hmm. and two genders for neuters. Okay, I haven't gotten that far in, in the ground. Yeah. Um, yeah, okay, let me let me summarize. So, Unigram entry, entropies are around nine bits per word, uh, and no language has Unigram entropies smaller than six bits per word. I mean, this is given, as, you know, the corpus that we have here. If you include spoken language, it might be somewhat lower, although I think if you're fair and you really created a... Um, uh, balanced corpus of many different registers, then you would probably get results which strongly correlate with this. That's my kind of intuition, but that's open to future research. But there, there seems to be kind of a lower bound, right, on, on, on how much information you have to transmit per word in, in a natural language. Um, and then the difference is more narrowly distributed and there is a strong linear relationship. And of course, some interesting questions, open questions. Uh, is it is it trivial in a mathematical sense? Is it straightforward in a linguistic statistical sense? Uh, does it hold in other human symbol systems? And does it hold in other animal communication systems? So that's, uh, yeah, that's something to, to look at. Thank you. Yep. I'd be interested if you lemmatize. And also take into consideration only the content words, would they collapse? Uh, I what is your intuition? But because I think with this method, maybe you can see how much uh, the morphological complexity is actually responsible for this variation and how much other players. Yeah, I did, I did lemmatization for the. So there is the B tagger and the tree tagger that I know of that you can use. And it's like not, I think 19 languages, and uh, that's wor what I did for my PhD. So I lemmatize the languages that you can lemmatize, and then you get kind of the difference between the lemmatized and unlemmatized word entropy is essentially a measure of yeah morphological complexity, right? And uh, then you can see that I think the highest one is for Finnish, where you have uh, around 20% reduction of entropy. So in that case. That's, that's kind of the highest you get in this sample of languages. And then for English, you would be around, I think, 5% five, five or so. So that's kind of the range of, of reduction. But actually, lemmatization, so um, inflection morphology seems to be much more strongly involved in creating word entropy than, say, derivation. So derivation is generally uh, much less involved. Um, because it, it makes sense, right? Because with inflection, what you do is you can inflect uh, the same word in, in many different categories, gender and, and singular, plural, and so on. And derivation, you know, 
you can have happy and unhappy, but, or happily, but it's not like you can do many, many different things with the same, with the same uh, word type. Yeah. Thank you very much. Fascinating for me thinking about this. This constant difference between the unigram entropy and the entropy rate, neither of which I think I understand fully. Me neither. <laughs> do you have an evolutionary reason for that? So we've, we've thought already about looking at this in, in non-human primate communication. Would you expect to find it there? And why do you think it holds at such a constant rate? What are the selection pressures or the constraints that, that hold it there? I think the most revealing research on this is by Simon Kirby and his group, where they do experiments where they let people uh, learn artificial languages and transmit artificial languages. So you have a system where you have, say, moving objects and colors, and then you have um, strings of letters randomly assigned to these, and they have to learn this. And then they hand it on to the next generation of learners, and they see how it evolves. Now what happens if, so if you just, if you just do what I just said, you, you, you tell them, learn this, um, and then you hand it on, what happens is that it collapses into a low entropy state. So they will just say the same thing to everything. Because learnability here is the pressure, and you know why use different forms if it's just about learning. Um, but then, if you if you put pressure to communicate, so if you sit two people together and say, now you have to use these forms to communicate, um, then you actually get something in between uh, the high entropy state and the low entropy state. Um, and I think that's what's happening in human in, in human languages that there is a pressure for learnability, which brings entropy down. But if it's too low, then you cannot really communicate all the different concepts that you want to communicate anymore. So it has to be somewhere in between. Yeah. Uh, I think before looking for deep explanations linguistically of this phenomenon you're observing, I want to see whether you can find any kind of sequence in nature that doesn't hold, where this doesn't hold. In nature, yeah. not so, by generating. So <coughs> find natural sequences that have long-range long range correlations, correlations and don't exhibit this property. Because that. I suspect what you're observing is a general property that you estimate to apply to, long, to systems with long-range correlations. No, because you can, for instance, take uh, Markov uh, mark processes of different orders. Mm -hmm. you take but the Markov next? process doesn't have long-range correlations. Don't have concrete correlations, but you are you you, you ask whether there is I, something. That's in why I specifically said with long range correlations. Okay, so the problem is how you define the long range correlations exactly. Well, infinite order Markov. Uh, yes, but probably you can you can you can tamper with this as well if you but can even, do it even in a Markov. Markov. But even in a Markov system, if you take if you just generate a very stupid order three Markov in which the entropy rate is actually the, the, the trigram entropy divided by 3. Yes. I'm pretty sure that you're very likely to find a correlation with the unigram entropy. Uh, I bet this is yes, if you, if, you, if you restrict yourself to the to third order, but I, I thought of, of mixing, of mixing, uh, uh, of mixing Markov processes of different orders. No, but what I mean to say is that before searching for a linguistic interpretation for this, yeah, find that it doesn't call for non linguistic systems. <coughs> also, what I thought is, well, can you devise a, a system where you get a nonlinear? Yeah, that's what I was trying to think. What would that imply? And it's, yeah. it's very difficult to imagine. Yeah. And how about other estimators of the rate? So have you tried whether this holds for? Because you tried many estimators of the unigram, right? So that only yeah. one for the rate. Right? So there will be another way of yeah. testing yeah. it's related to the Yes, or three based yes. methods. The, yeah, I mean that was the only one I well, could Well the problem with example with. zip is that it is for finite alphabet. Yeah, but it can be extra, it, it can be extra, it, it is for finite alphabet, but you can do it based on the letters and then multiply yes. by the average word length. Yes. This is, this is also but, but so, so what Gao say in their paper is that this is actually based on the result by lentil yeah. 1978, right? Yes, yeah, but this is, this, is based, this is a modification of the lentil algorithm yeah. that we were using there. Uh, so well, it's it not exactly the modification of lentil algorithm, it's a bit different. Yeah. 
which is quite different. Uh, it uses some idea from the Lempelsif uh, uh, code, but uh, this is this is some result about convergence of uh, of, of the recurrence time statistics. Yeah. Actually, one thing I'm maybe I don't really understand this the correct way, but what this so the relation to lempel sif as far as I understand, is that if you find a contiguous string from a certain position that has been somewhere in the text before, what lempel sif actually does is it says, instead of spelling this out and wasting space on your uh, hard drive, you can just point it back to yes. where you saw it before, right? So, but, so, what this so actually what this estimator does is it only takes contiguous substrings, right? Yes. And in, in natural language, I mean, you can, so if, if you have German auxiliary verbs, you can say, you know, if you have, I have him seen, then have seen, they have a connection, but there is something in between which... And that, that's a cool thing that Lebel C demonstrated by a theorem, that their algorithm, at least for stationary series, and that's a problem we haven't talked about, because everything we're seeing is not stationary, actually converges to the, to the optimal compression rate which is within a degree of the entropy. So, so that means it would that the compression method is universal for a stationary robotic system. How does this relate to the, so the gap? It doesn't, it doesn't matter that you have these continuous things, because they're going to be stored in code words, <laughs> and at the end you get it, in, given an infinite yes. sequence. Sorry? I can make a remark. That I didn't understand that this was based on a compression algorithm, but there mm -hmm. are these results by Cosma Shalisi showing that compression is actually bad for estimating entropy rates. So that this leads to a very spurious correlate or spurious result. So he has published on that that you should not it's I don't know the details. Yeah, but, but there was a discussion so I, I know I'm not story. just I wanted to remark well, that, that, that perhaps that, this hints to the to something that but the thing is, that's what uh, Cosmo Salishi was saying is that you shouldn't be using, for instance, uh, GZIP 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 yes, as yeah. a compressor. What, what they are doing is, is more so. Okay, good. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay. Oh, I think, thank you for that. Okay, I, I, it was a good test. test. Yes. Well, in general, whenever somebody says, I think there is a better estimator, that, you know, we can try to implement it. But. I think you're doing a pretty good job already with estimators. Yeah. So I don't think yeah. you're going to get much better. Mm. Okay. Well, it's, it's great. It's, Great to see this passion uh, <laughs> discussing. I have to be the policeman and, <laughs> and remind well and, and remind you that now we have a, a welcome uh, reception. Uh, maybe you can tell us something about the details. Well, the welcome reception should be served uh, across this wall. Uh -huh. <laughs> okay. In this, so. uh, uh, in this hall that we have lunch. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you.